So next up is Quentin Monet, uh, who will be presenting uh, stateful packet processing and open state implementation with uh, eBPF. Quentin? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. So, uh, I'm Quentin, I work at uh, C3 and I've come to, uh, to talk about the open state interface for stateful packet processing and uh, about the possibility to implement it with uh, eBPF among other solutions. So the initial plan was to uh, talk a lot about eBPF and to present it and uh, at some point I uh, somewhat changed my mind so uh, it will be a bit less about eBPF and more about open state. Uh, so just before we get to the technical details, uh, we are working in software defined networks. So we have uh, physical hosts, we have virtual machines, we have uh, programmable switches and controllers. So controllers are used to, uh, to configure the switches in a centralized way. Regarding data path, we have uh, two paths for data. The uh, this is kind of shortcut when all packets are processed by the, by the programmable switch. And uh, for packets that require more processing tasks, more processing operations, they are usually raised as exceptions and sent to the controller. So this is the case uh, for uh, every packet belonging to, uh, to stateful flows. Uh, by stateful, I mean um, flows for which the forwarding decision will depend on the traffic that has been previously observed the switch. So um, the idea behind this talk is what if we could take as many packets as we can from this uh, standard path and move them to, the, to this faster path, to this uh, shortcut path. So can we find a way to make the switch smart enough to do that uh, while keeping this uh, centralized way to, uh, to configure everything? So this is also uh, the idea behind the BBAP project, uh, which is a uh, European research project that I have started in uh, January 2015. Uh, it's expected to close uh, next month, actually, so we are near the end of the project. And the idea is to get various speed reactive control and processing tasks inside the switches. Uh, while well keeping this centralized control, uh, while well being scalable, but when everyone wants to be everyone wants to be scalable, so it's nothing new. And we want also to be a uh, platform independent, so not to rely on any specific hardware or vendor solution. So um, as for the partners of the project, uh, it's a research project. So we have uh, business companies, uh, we have also academics partners on the right side. Uh, and all those uh, partners have designed uh, what we call the BIBA architecture, uh, or BIBA switch. And it's, uh, it's made of three components. There is open state for stateful processing. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, just after that. There is something for in-switch packet generation, but we will not see it in the presentation. And there's also open packet processor, which is an extension based on the two other components. And we'll see a little at the end of the presentation. So open state, it's for stateful packet processing. And the concept is to, um, to forward packets depending on what we have seen already. Uh, so uh, what we need is to, to keep states for the, for the traffic. Uh, so we, we need for when a new packet arrives, we need to uh, perform a lookup for uh, the state uh, the flow belongs to is in. And then we will need a second lookup somewhere to, uh, to find what action we must do for the state. And uh, then the, the first step of the process is to update the state of the flow to a new value that we will uh, obtain for, from the second lookup as well. So for this, we need two tables, the state tables, the first one on the left, and the XFSM table. It stands for ext uh, Extended Finite State Machine, which is the mathematical model uh, implemented by this, uh, this process. So uh, here's a case study for, uh, for seeing how it works. Concretely, we try to do port marking. Uh, <coughs> so usually port marking consists in uh, a server telling to everyone that it 
port, uh, for example, SSH port, uh, port 22 is uh, closed, and only when a client sends the correct secret sequence of packets, then the, the server says, okay, it's open for you, you can, uh, you can connect to this port. So it's a security measure. Um, so to implement this sequence, for example, uh, in my case, uh, packets on UDP port 111, 2222, and so on until 4. Uh, to implement this, we need to, uh, to register somewhere the, uh, the state we're in to remember the previous packets from this sequence. So uh, this is the diagram, uh, the state machine for this example. We start in the initial state here, when the port is closed, sorry. Uh, when we receive the first packet for, of this sequence, we move to step one, two, three, and then we open the port, the SSH port. And if we find a packet in between uh, that's not part of the sequence, we go back to the initial state. So this is a state table for this example. Uh, at the beginning of the program, it's nearly empty. We just have a rule that says that for all flows, uh, we are in the different states, so that's the initial state here. So when a packet arrives, uh, we get state default initial for this packet, and then we perform the second lookup in the XFSM table. So in this table, depending on the packet we receive, we will match on, uh, on a state and on an event. For example, the event is UDP destination port 1111. In this case, so if we have the default state and the correct port, we will, uh, we will return an action, which is drop the packet. We don't want to forward this packet. It just, uh, just in the switch, we drop it. Then we to reach the server and we will move to the next state, which is step one. If the packet is not part of the sequence, otherwise it's not, um, in other words, it's not the correct part, or it's not a state we know, we just have a default rule at the end uh, that reinitiates uh, the, the state of the packets. So we get this value, we, uh, we perform this action on the packet, and we update uh, the state table with the new state we got for this flow. So after the update operation, for example, if the packet was part of the sequence, we will have a new rule with uh, this, uh, the, the correct metadata for this flow uh, and the new state we found. So uh, that's quite simple. So we have a variety of uh, implementations for, uh, for this in the project and the questions uh, we try to answer to uh, for, my, for my part was can we do this with eBPF? So um, eBPF I won't uh, we'll dig into the details again. We have uh, had two good presentations already thanks to Daniel and uh, Thomas. Um, so uh, here is again the, the same diagram that you saw with uh, the CBM presentation. So I'm using TC hooks to attach program inside the kernel. Uh, I can compile my program from a C subset of code. Um, and I can also communicate with uh, user programs uh, through maps. Uh, and that will be very important because by default, so uh, the BPF program when it uh, when it runs it processes a packet and then once it's finished, we lose everything about its state. It's discarded and then when the next packet arrives, we start a new with uh, with nothing. So um, we have maps. And uh, as Thomas said already, we, have, uh, we can keep states with those maps because they are persistent between uh, different instances of the program. Uh, they can also be shared amongst multiple programs. I don't care, but they can also be shared with user space. And this will uh, enable us to, uh, to initialize the maps. So uh, let's go. Let's use uh, hash maps for the open state tables. So uh, the, the code corresponding to, to this is on uh, GitHub, if you want to have a look at this more in details. So I, uh, I use the first uh, file, which is uh, my header file, openstate.h, in which I have the 
key and value for the state tables, the key and uh, value structures. Uh, I'm using ether type, IP source, IP destination, and um, I, my, uh, my state table will return a value for the current state of this flow. Uh, we also have the XFSM table below, so uh, I will match on, uh, again, properties I want for the event, and also the state I, uh, I got from the first table. And then uh, this second table will return both an action to perform on the packet and uh, the next state to update the first table. That's the, the file for a program, so uh, part of this file, obviously. I skipped everything about uh, header processing, so I just jumped to the, to the state table lookup. So I have to, uh, to set a key and then to perform my lookup with one of uh, the uh, eBPF uh, helper functions from the kernel that uh, make it able to, uh, to accept the, the maps. Uh, if I get a return value from these maps, then I go to the XFSM lookup, otherwise, but I should not reach this point, I go to the end of program and return uh, some kind of error code. Uh, this is the next part I would have to, uh, to perform the second lookup in the XFSM table. So I set up again a key, I perform my lookup, and depending on the value, if I got something, I mean, I will uh, first update the, the state in the state table for this flow. So I will use uh, the next state I got from the XFSM table to perform the update, and after that, I can just switch on the, on the action I got from the, from the XFL table. So, uh, action drop, then I send the code for TC action shots for telling TC that he has to, uh, to shut down the packet, and otherwise I can forward it. Uh, so, this is, uh, this is nearly all for the code. So, we can uh, compile it with Clang. Uh, that's the command line I use. We can attach it to, uh, to, uh, um, to a QDisk uh, as a BPF fighter. And uh, the only thing we have to do after that is to initialize the maps. So, I have not provided the code in the slides. Uh, we can use a uh, user space program that relies on BPF system calls to. Uh, to fill the maps from user space. Uh, also, there are tools known as BCC tools, uh, BPF compiler uh, that use Python wrappers to do it in a probably easier way, but it's not necessary, so we can do both. Uh, okay. So I don't have time for demo, but this is just a screenshot of what I got for spot marking. It's not uh, really impressive. So I send packets from port 22, then the correct sequence, so then again packets on port 22, and only the last packets, P7, P8, P9, uh, pass through the port marking application. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, after the working, I just have another second use case, which is a token bucket, which is maybe more interesting uh, from the industry point of view than uh, pop working. Uh, the thing is, with uh, this open state interface, uh, I cannot exactly uh, implement a classical token bucket, so a bucket with tokens, and each time a packet arrives, a token is consumed, and when we have no more token, we cannot forward any more packet. It's a rate limiter uh, use case. So I cannot do this, uh, this as a bucket with a counter for tokens. I have to find another way to implement it because of the, uh, the idea of the operation for open state. So uh, I'm using an equivalent algorithm with a tiny window that shifts to the right one slot at a time. And uh, I have three cases. So if the packet arrives between the time boundaries of this window, it's okay, it's normal traffic, I can forward this packet. And then I move the window from one slot to the right. Uh, if the packet arrives, uh, too, uh, too late for the window, it means that we have not seen uh, a lot of packets during the last period because we have not shifted the window much, so uh, it's okay, we can forward also the packet. 
and uh, we will initialize the position of the window to the current position of the, to, of the packet. And the last case is uh, in case of heavy loads. Uh, when there are many packets arriving in the same type slot, when we have shifted the window too much on the right side, so there is no token left for this packet. So we drop the packet and do not move the window. So we also need more things on the on the modeling side. We have to use uh, the extension of OpenState. It's called Open Packet Processor. So it's uh, it's an extension. So we will use everything from OpenState plus uh, global and perflow registers, which are like uh, variables. Uh, and these registers are evaluated uh, with a set of conditions. Uh, and these conditions, the result of those conditions will be used to, uh, to match, uh, for the match in the XFSM lookup. So for token bucket, we have uh, two registers, Tmin and Tmax, that correspond to these values here and there that define the boundaries of the time window at, uh, at every moment. Uh, so we can have conditions with those, uh, those values, those variables. And we can evaluate those conditions. And depending on the result, true or false of these uh, conditions, we will, uh, we will match or not in the XFSM table. So this is the full diagram of OPP architecture. Uh, without entering too much into the details, first we process the packet to extract any information we need to match. And we perform the first lookup in the state table. So uh, on a uh, on this, uh, on this meta packet metadata, we get the state for the flow and also a set of registers. Uh, with those registers and possibly global registers, uh, we evaluate the conditions that we want to use. And then the second lookup is done on the result of those conditions, the state we are in, and uh, the packet events, for example, the UDP port for pop knocking. And it returns as before uh, the next state for the flow, uh, the action to perform as a packet, and also an update function that will be used to update uh, per flow and global registers. So on the eBPF side, we have uh, nearly everything we need already. We need to add those, uh, those registers, those conditions. Also for, uh, for the token bucket, we need the arrival time of the packet. There is an internal helper for this, so it's uh, quite, uh, quite useful. Um, and the conditions can be uh, defined in each program. So for example, in my program, I first get the, the arrival time of the packet. I perform my state lookup. And then I evaluate conditions, so uh, I've, I, uh, I've implemented a wrapper to, to do so, to check whether uh, current time is uh, greater or equal to the teaming, et cetera. And uh, then I perform the second lookup on the XFSM table based both on the current state, the result and the conditions. Uh, for the tables, it's the same. We just have the, the registers in the tables. So again, just a screenshot for the, this application. I sent uh, I sent 100 packets from the client, and on the server I got the first uh, six packets. My uh, my token bucket had a, had a capacity of five tokens. Uh, so uh, first packets uh, come through. Then we have to wait each time that a new token uh, is generated again, so that the next packet may arrive. All of the packets are dropped. So, um, okay. So this is just a list of uh, some uh, additional use case for OpenState and OPP. Uh, for the project, we use it to uh, to do quality of service, uh, to do um, failure detection and recovery, and also there's an application I appreciate quite a lot, which is uh, denial of service. Uh, detection and uh, mitigation. Uh, so I won't describe it here. For the details, I have some uh, blog articles if you want to read them on, uh, on some of these use cases. And uh, to uh, conclude, uh, we think that eBPF makes a nice target for, uh, nice target for the Buba architecture. Uh, so both uh, open state and open packet processor. We have some limitations with uh, this, uh, this implementation. So, um, 
For example, we have no wild carding mechanism yet in uh, BPF, so if I want to say, uh, okay, now I want to match uh, a packet with anything uh, for the UDP destination port, and I just want to focus on the source port. Uh, currently, it's a bit difficult to do the, with BPF. Uh, there's also the problem for uh, concurrent accesses. If I want to, uh, to run my stateful application on uh, several cores at, uh, at a time, uh, the packet won't necessarily pr be processed and access to the maps in the same order as they arrive. Uh, but otherwise, globally, it's, it looks uh, quite well. So uh, we have no implementations of this uh, open state uh, architecture for the BIBA project. The BPF is just a small subset of what we've done. So if you want to, uh, to go and have a look, the reference implementation is uh, done of a virtual switch, which is a off soft switch. Uh, it's accelerated with the PFQ framework. There are also um, several other implementations and uh, acceleration prototypes. Uh, I know that some uh, some partners are running uh, open state on top of uh, the the mode driver for DPDK uh, on uh, FPGA. So uh, also uh, everything is available on GitHub if you want to have a look at this. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. If you want to uh, to see more details about uh, some of these points, including the the deliverables of the project, you can uh, go and see them. Uh, no problem. If you have questions, I will be, be glad to answer them. Yeah? So, what is the real performance, for example, for all the ones that are very good idea? Uh, so what's the real performance? Uh, depends on what implementation you run. For eBPF, I take it. Uh, I've not finished uh, performance tests yet, but uh, it uses uh, eBPF uh, facilities, so it will be the same as uh, eBPF with TC. I think the, the features that are available uh, for eBPF was uh, for simple drop with uh, TC, eBPF TC. Uh, it was uh, something like four and something million packets per second on uh, 3.7 gigahertz processor, I think. So it will be uh, it will not be as fast as this because we use maps, we use hash maps, so we have to hash uh, hash values, and uh, of course it will be uh, slower than this. But uh, still, I think we can get pretty good performances. I forgot. I think I forgot a point for the next step. So next step include trying this with uh, XDP hooks, so as to uh, to attain better performances, hopefully. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you.